I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians. Today we're going to be looking at chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. This morning we are going to uh, finish our quick overview. We're going to make it through verse 11 this morning. And again, just the last couple of weeks, we've been doing a quick overview. It's been a few years, but we did start in Philippians. We just never finished it. So we're going to come back and, and finish it. But I wanted just to overview where we have been. And, um, <clears throat> and so the last few weeks, we've acknowledged the theme, really, of the book of Philippians. And, and that is one of citizenship or koinonia, this idea of fellowship or partnership, love and, um, and body life as it were, in all a response to the gospel. It is the gospel that, that calls us and, and makes what we have when, when we gather together, who we are in Christ, it makes it very, very distinct from any other kind of group. And really, Philippians is a book about the implications of the gospel. How, how then to live out the gospel. And, and so we started last week and the week prior Uh, Look at chapter 1, verse 27. Really, that is the topical sentence, if you will, for the body of the letter. And the main commandment through this entire book. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. And that's the idea of of everyone here who has been called by the gospel, who has received the gospel, who has been uh, made a child of God and and placed into the local body of the church, the koinonia, that fellowship, that, that precious communion with one another because we have precious communion with our Heavenly Father. Because of all of that, we are called here to conduct ourselves in a worthy manner. Conduct ourselves accordingly. Because God has made us through the gospel new creation together. We are to live out that calling. And that's what the book of Philippians is all about. I want to begin then reading in chapter 3, first 11 verses. And I want you to note the distinctiveness this morning. The distinctiveness of koinonia. Koinonia, again, being that Greek word that is very difficult to translate into English because it can mean and can be translated and is in the Bible translated in English so many ways. Fellowship, partnership. Love, affection, communion, both describing communion with God and communion with one another. It is, again, that body life concept. You see here in this chapter, then he goes in and he talks about the distinctiveness. What makes this particular gathering unique? What makes this, uh, this body life unique in all of the world? It's the gospel. Let's begin reading here. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And I write the same things again. It is no trouble to me. It is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in spirit in the spirit of God, and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else is mine to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised in the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. 
as to the righteousness which is found in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in the in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I might gain Christ. I might be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith that I might know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I might obtain to the resurrection from the dead. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word. Lord, it it instructs us as to how we are then to live in light of the gospel. And Lord, we thank you for the gospel, for it is not our righteousness. It is nothing that we have done. It is not our works. It is not our merit. And Lord, you have called us into this salvation, and you've called us into this body, not because we were good people, but because of your grace and for your immense, wonderful purposes. And so, Father, help each heart today to be submissive to your spirit, to be obedient to your will. Again, that you might find in each of us, and indeed all of us as a body, a willingness to be who you've called us to be. A willingness to be the church of God. A willingness to work out this koinonia in a way that would be glorifying to you. Lord, that no one here would put confidence in the flesh, our own flesh, or even our corporate sense of that flesh. And Lord, that we would rejoice in that exclusive work of the gospel that you have caused us, Lord, to know and enjoy and embrace. And may we value Christ all the more individually and corporately. And Father, may you be well pleased as we seek to live out your word, obey your word, and understand your word this morning. We ask all of these things in the power of your Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The gospel is distinct. The gospel is distinct. That's what we see in these verses. In in the first 11 verses, actually it goes through the entire uh, third chapter of this wonderful letter to the Philippians. We have looked at the reception of the gospel in the first chapter, the first 11 verses. We looked at the progress report because and in light of the participation of this local church in the, in the gospel. We, we saw the passion of the participation of the gospel in the latter part of the first chapter. And we rejoiced to, to see Again, this church to to respond to to the gospel in the way that they did. To live out the distinctiveness of the gospel. We we saw the admonition of the living gospel in verses 27 through 30. We saw the attitude that preserves the body, preserves the that the nature of the body of Christ formed by the gospel in chapter 2, that attitude that that we are to have because it was first in Christ, that that we are to live for Christ, that we are to live our lives for one another, that we are to be exactly whom God called us to be in placing us into a body, placing us into a family. We're not to look out for our own interests, but to look out for the interests of each other. For that echoes 
the, the, the admonition and, the, and the, uh, the, the attitude of the gospel and of Christ. And we saw this wonderful reputation of these two men of God last week. Timothy and Epaphroditus. The one who was just so faithful serving the Lord and serving the body is serving even Paul that, that wonderful example of Timothy, of his loyal devotion and selfless service. And then we saw even one of the Philippians themselves, Epaphrodites, whom they called to, to bring the offering that they had given for Paul to be Paul's helper as he is imprisoned. And how that through this whole uh, service on behalf of the, the body of Christ and the name of Christ to Paul, that he fell ill and he, he risked his life for the body of Christ, for the sake of the gospel, for the ministry uh, to Paul and unto the Lord. And what a wonderful example of koinonia. What an example, what a reputation that exemplifies the gospel. We've been called because of the gospel to do wonderful things. We, we saw the sanctification process that is to be a part of our lives. That we're to work all things out. To respond to the gospel. And uh, Lord, that we are to do all things without grumbling and disputing, proving ourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God, above reproach and in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. You see and you hear the distinctiveness. The gospel has plucked us out of the world. We were just like everyone else before the gospel came and transformed our heart through the living and abiding word. And he made us new creation in Christ. Keep your finger there in Philippians and turn over to 2 Corinthians for just a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want us to acknowledge this. Look at, cha uh, look at chapter 5, verse 14 and following. Again, this is the distinctiveness of the gospel. This is what the gospel does. This is the implication of the gospel. It makes us distinct. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this... That one died for all, that's Jesus. Jesus died for all, therefore all died. So all of us are then to be dead to our own interests. Because Christ died for us. Because we have received the gospel. This isn't work salvation, but this is a salvation that is made such a, an impact, such a distinction that now our life then echoes that gospel and we're to live much, much differently. Why? Well, it goes on. For Jesus, he died for all, verse 15, so that they may live, no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose on their behalf. We're to live for Christ and for one another. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, not even though we have, excuse me, according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now, now we know him no longer this way. Therefore, any, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. God, through the gospel, has made us a new creation. We are distinct. We're called out from the world. 
And we're to live that distinction. Look at chapter 6, verse 14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership, that's koinonia, have righteousness with lawlessness? And what fellowship has light with darkness? Do you see the distinction? What harmony has Christ with Baal? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and therefore come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you, and I will be your father to you, and I shall, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord. That is distinctiveness. The church is to be different. Our fellowship is to be different. We don't judge each other by any means, by the flesh any longer. Because the gospel has called us to unity. The gospel has called us to love. The gospel has made us new creatures in Christ. God, through the gospel, has commissioned us, has compelled us, has set us apart, and made us distinct. Go back to Philippians now. The gospel is distinct. And we are to be distinct. What makes the fellowship of the church distinct? The gospel. The gospel. And the gospel echoes through the way in which we relate to one another. The gospel echoes through the way that we fellowship together. The the way that we interact together. The way that we relate to one another. The way that we love one another. The way that we share all things together. Because we are together the household of God. We are together the temple of God. And we've been set apart and made distinct for this reason. And so this morning... I want us to study four marks of this distinction of koinonia. So that our fellowship will be distinct, different from the world, different from religion. And that our communion with God and with one another, again, would live out the distinctiveness of the gospel. And in that way, we become lights in the world. A corporate light. To the world. And so this morning I want us to see that there is in this first 11 verses. I'll give you the four points so you can just jot these down. We're going to look at a distinct position in the first two verses. And then we're going to look at a distinct identity in the third verse. A distinct testimony Verses 4 through 7, and then the rest will be a distinct value. The gospel here is is on uh, Paul's mind and heart, and he's called them, and he's going to remind them. Let's look at the distinct position with which Paul reminds this church. That's who they are. That's who they are. Look at. Verse 1, finally, now don't get tripped over that. That's kind of like when the pastor is uh, just finished his introduction and he says in conclusion. It's actually uh, just a transitionary word. He's he just getting going here. We got 44 more verses to go. And so this is just a word of continuation, but it's a break with what he's been talking about before. Not totally different, but again, it's another point. So he says, finally, my brethren, notice everything in the church is brothers and sisters. Now, that's not just a term of affection. That is a spiritual reality. He says, rejoice in the Lord. And notice where the rejoicing comes from. This little phrase that we often read and we read by it and we don't really think much of it, but it needs to be underlined here. 
Because it marks the position, the unique position for all those who are enjoying koinonia. For all those who have received the gospel, they are in the Lord. And we see this throughout the epistles. We see the phrase, in Christ. Paul will often say, like in Colossians, he'll say, you are in Christ. He'll, he'll solve that and remind us that theologically. And then he'll spend the rest of the book saying, therefore, live it out. Live it out. You, you're in the Lord. You're in Christ. This is the sphere of koinonia. Everybody who's not in the Lord cannot enjoy the fellowship. They, they don't understand the fellowship. They cannot be a part of the fellowship. It's not that we would not welcome them. But because they have not been called by God, because they have not, been, have not received the gospel, because their lives and their hearts have not been transformed, because they have not become new creation, they're not a part of this gospel. They're not a part of this koinonia, excuse me. But here he's saying, brethren, listen, rejoice. We have much joy in this distinct position. In this position, we have joy. In this world, we have all kinds of trouble. Well, we could talk about that, and we've talked about that before. We studied James. We know in this life, we're going to have tribulation. We're going to have trials. We're going to have difficulties. We prayed about a lot of those. This morning, some of our brothers and sisters in Christ in this body are going through difficult times. But there is joy in the Lord. Because in the sphere of the context of koinonia, there is, that there is such encouragement because we are in the Lord. And that is a joy that is exclusive to those who are in the Lord they are in the Lord. They are saved. They're being sanctified. And their, and their future is secured. And that brings bring joy in all of our hearts. And should frequently, as Paul here is reminding them of where their joy is. That's a theme throughout Philippians. You can look at chapter 1, verse 4. You can look at uh, chapter 2, verse 2. Uh, chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, and then 28 and 29, and then we're going to read some more in chapter 3, and then and it'll spill all over in chapter 4. Joy is a major theme. Why? Because of koinonia, because of the gospel, because there is a distinct gospel, there is a distinct body, and there is the distinct position of joy. And it's joy not in what we are experiencing that may come and go, but again, because of our relationship with Christ, we have great, abiding, secure joy. Look at what he says going on in verse 1. I write the same things to you, it is no trouble to me. He's not reluctant, he says here. He's not bothered in any way to, to reteach them or remind them of, of what he has taught them before. And so he's going to go over the distinctiveness of the gospel. He's going to go into the doctrine of justification. He is going to remind them of their joy and in light of all of those things, again, their position in the Lord. He says it's a safeguard for them. He wants to protect them. See, we can be in the Lord and we can have secure joy, but lose our sense of that joy. But if we're in the Lord, we will never actually lose the foundation of our joy because our joy is, again, in the Lord and thus unmovable. But he thus says, again, I'm going to remind you of these things and it's not a bother to me, but it's a safeguard from you. So he's safeguarding, a reminding of them of their position in joy. And then he's going to contrast. Look at what he says in verse 2. It's almost jarring. But again, I want you to pick up the fact that this is a distinct position. 
There's joy in the Lord. And then verse 2, there is warning for those outside, those pretenders. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. So look here at this word, beware. It means to pay careful attention. To avoid <clears throat> their, uh, adopting their destructive beliefs and practices. The Judaizers were very much a problem for the early church. Certainly, you had Gentile influences, you had philosophy, you have uh, Greek ideas that were being poured in, you had the super apostles that were influencing the church. But here, what Paul is guarding, uh, calling them to guard their hearts and their minds against was the Judaizers, those that wanted to drag them back into the Mosaic law. When they had it began to experience the new covenant realities of being in the Lord and in Christ. And so he says, beware, pay special, careful attention to them and avoid their destructive beliefs and their destructive practices. Paul uses very strong languages, language here. He says very straightforward about these false teachers. They are called dogs. There's two Greek words for dogs, and one of them is, is, a, is a cute word that, you know, we could name, that uh, describes our, our cute, cuddly pets. But, but here, we're, we're not talking about Olaf. You know, this is not that kind of a dog. These, if you're not a dog person, this is why you're not a dog person, probably. These are ravenous dogs. These are diseased dogs. These are scavengers. And they would roam the city and they would eat scraps and garbage. They would defecate all over the city. They were horrible. This is life before they had dog catchers. This is, uh, this, these, are, these are awful creatures. They're snarling, biting, disease-filled, ravaging through cities. And ironically here, the Jews called the Gentiles dogs. But here, Paul is calling the Judaizers dogs. He goes on with a second name, evil workers. Again, we don't have time to go through all the details. Last time we did when we went through it. But this is, again, a name for false teachers throughout the New Testament, evil workers who are trying to earn God's favor through their own merits, through their own works. And then, again, ironically, he says that they, <clears throat> this is, um, beware of the false circumcision. And it's not the normal Greek word for circumcision. It is a word that, that means mutilation. But they caught the word play there. They have mutilated the truth of God's word. They have mutilated their, their calling and their distinctiveness. And so we, they are called to be warned against this. Don't fall in with them. They have no part in, in this fellowship. They say they're religious. They say they even believe the Bible. And they say they have all of the rituals and they have all of the practice. And they went into the church and they said, listen, you, you have to adopt all of the Old Testament ceremonial uh, rituals in order to be saved. And they were very, very deceptive. How do I know they were deceptive? Because Peter, of all people, falls back into that. We go to Galatians. Paul starts right away. Which you so far, is you're so quickly falling away to another gospel. And it's not really another gospel because there's no gospel in this other gospel. There's no good news. It doesn't save. And Paul has to rebuke Peter. And fortunately, Peter does. 
uh, repent. And yet, <clears throat> here, again, that's exactly what he's calling them to, to. To realize the relevance of the gospel. To realize their position in Christ is unique. They're not to be infected by the diseased, rabid dogs and the lawless. That they, even though they were lawless, they, they called themselves law-abiding. The gospel is in Christ through faith. We have our sins fully paid for and we're given the righteousness of Christ. That is the important doctrine of justification. And you might be here this morning saying, well, how relevant is that to us? We don't uh, have any Judaizers running around. But I would advocate to say, yes, we, we do have those. Ha have we not heard others claiming to be uh, Christians, claiming to the, the authority of God, saying, well, if you want to be saved, then you need to come to our church. If you want to be saved, then you need to be baptized. If you want to be saved, you need to fill this card out. You need to walk an aisle. You, you, you need to throw your watch in the fire. You need to throw your stick in the fire. You, you need to have this certain emotional experience. Or you need to have this supernatural experience of speaking somehow in tongues, which really isn't tongues. No, no, this is not the gospel. This is not the gospel. We are to avoid these. And we're to uphold those who have given themselves to the gospel, who are in the Lord, and there is great, great joy. So perhaps this morning, you're, in, you're here this morning, you're exhausted, you're frustrated because you're running around and you're trying to listen to these people who tell you, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. And you're trying to maintain your position before the Lord. You're, you're trying to be good. You're, you're trying to be obedient. But the gospel said no. Put your faith in Christ. If your position is in Christ. Then Christ is your righteousness. If I'm going to please God, I'm going to run after God, but finally pleasing Him, and you're frustrated, you're exhausted, and you can't get off that, that uh, treadmill of thought. It's just running, running, and exhausted, and not getting anywhere. Paul wants to remind you this morning of Romans 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, Justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom also we have obtained an introduction by faith and to his grace in which we stand. And we exalt in the hope of the glory of God. What is he saying there? It's not about your works that gets your position in Christ or maintains your con, uh, position in Christ. It's the righteousness of Christ. And it comes to us through faith. This is the distinctiveness of our position in the Lord. In the Lord, we have forgiveness of our sins as Jesus bore all of our unrighteous filthy rags of, right, of unrighteousness on the cross. And wherein through a divine exchange, we then gained his righteousness. And it is that position of his righteousness being imputed to us that we stand and we have such a glorious, joyful position in him no matter what. And we don't need to listen to the barking dogs or the lives of evil workers or the false circumcision coming in and telling us that we need to get back on the treadmill. We have a distinct position and Paul wants to remind them of that distinct position. He goes on to talk about the distinct identity and notice the, the difference here. He's painting a, a contrast. 
He calls them the first, the false circumcision, that is, the evil workers and the dogs, those who believed in works salvation. And in verse 3, he gives us our identity, that is, the believing identity, that is, the Christian identity. The identity that all those who enjoy koinonia have. He says, for we are the true circumcision who worship uh, in spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. There is a distinct identity because here Paul is saying, listen, we're not of the old covenant. We're, we're, we're not of these Judaizers. No, we're partaking in the spirit-empowered, gospel-given new covenant. We're altogether different. We are true. And then he gives three reasons, three, three characteristics of this true circumcision that is the true identity of the church, the true identity that makes the, this koinonia distinct. They are distinct because they're characterized by those who worship in the Spirit of God. And this word worship means, and it's translated service. And it's always used throughout the Old Testament to talk about the uniqueness of Israel's worship. But this worship is not man-centered. It is not man-merited. It is not man-triggered. It is given by the Spirit of God. That is, the Spirit of God has led us empowered us, directed us, transformed us so that we can actually worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus talked to the woman at the well. Second, we see the second characteristic of this distinct identity. We glory in Christ. He's going to talk about that in later context. We glory in Christ. Our glory is in the gospel. We're not to be ashamed of the gospel. For Christ is our glory. In Galatians 6, 13, Paul talks about, if you're going to boast, boast not in the flesh, but boast in the Lord, boast in Christ. Talk about boasting. This word for glory is boasting. What are we about? We're, we're, we're about bringing glory to Christ because we're of a fellowship that acknowledges everything we are and everything we do is to manifest and testify and send out glory and give glory to Christ because he is our life. He is our identity. Again, going back to verse 1, he is, we are in the Lord. We are in Christ. And third, in contrast to this, is a third uh, characteristic. We have no confidence in the flesh. He's not talking about our skin. He's talking about our unredeemed humidness. In Matthew 26, verse 41, we keep watching and praying that you do not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. And every brother in Christ, every sister in Christ, everyone in Koinonia knows that we are weak in and of ourselves. There still exists in our life unredeemed flesh. That unredeemed, that, that old man in us. And so... We have no confidence in that. Our confidence is in the glory of Christ. We are moved to to worship in spirit and in truth. That's our identity. Mark number three. We've looked at the position. We've looked at the identity. Now let's look at the distinct testimony. Such a great thing listening to the testimonies of the redeemed. But here Paul's temp- testimony, and, and he gives us really an echo of, of each of our testimonies because there was a time in our lives where we were filled with pride. We thought we could commend ourselves to God because we were good people. 
And of course, that goodness has always been uh, related to some other person who was maybe not as good. And so you thought God may be graded by the curve and you said, well, I'm a good person. I'm a really good person compared to other people. And our world says, you know, hey, it's, it's all about your self-identity, right? It's all about your pride. The, the better pride, the more pride, the, the better uh, self-identity you have, the, the better person you are. So we all come out of this and this is his testimony, this distinct testimony. We see seven spiritual merits here that Paul lists. He lists his works and his achievements, his merits, those things with which he was working very, very diligently. And he was a quote unquote good person. But distinctive Christian testimony knows all human achievement has. No, uh, is not only not helpful, but it is a minus. It's not even neutral. It's, a, it's not a plus. It's a minus. He says, I had great right rituals. He was circumcised on the eighth day. Literally, he was an eighth dayer. Uh, he, he was a Jew. He was born and uh, he followed all of the right rituals at the proper time. Number two, he was... He has spiritual inheritance. He was of the nation of Israel. And so there was merit in that. Number three, he had a noble rank. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. A prominent noble tribe of Israel uh, because of men like Mordecai and Esther and Saul and others. All Benjamites. And that was a unique noble rank. Number four, he had family tradition. He was the Hebrew of Hebrews. Number five, he had elite religion. He was, as to the law, a Pharisee. Again, that was not the kind of word it is now, but it marked, rather, the highest level of devotion. It, it talked about being an elite, influential, highly respected group of men who had high regard for the law. So he had elite religion. He was very sincere. The idea of a zealot or to be zealous. He was a, a, a zealot, a persecutor of the church. Means he was sincere. So in his heart of hearts, he was sincere. And how many of us used to think that? Well, as long as I'm sincere. And we know Paul, in, in, in this testimony, is saying, I was sincerely wrong. Sincerely wrong about my sincerity being a merit. Number seven, self-righteousness. As to the law, which, was in, uh, which is in the law, I was blameless. He's not saying he was perfect. He's just, you know, according to this man-made rituals, according to this man-made thing that the Pharisees uh, were all about, he would be found blameless. Nobody could say, aha, Paul, look at that. He didn't fall. No, he followed. <clears throat> And Paul acknowledges here in his testimony that none of these roads lead to heaven, but they are, are not roads to heaven, but they are roadblocks. All human religion, all human achievement, all supposed merit repel salvation of the divine achievement. They block grace. They stand in the way of complete dependence on the sufficiency and the complete work of Christ on the cross. Listen this morning, if you are drowning in the sea of sin and you're trying to keep your head above the water, the first thing you need to do is let go of the heavy anchor you're trying to tote. That heavy anchor that is your fleshly pride that, that told you that was your life preserver. Paul finally gets to the point where he, he sees the risen Lord and in a moment he's undone. And he sees all of his merit now has become an anchor. It's not the life preserver he thought it was. So this morning if you are hanging on to human merits... 
Understand, it's not a life preserver. It's an anchor. And it's only going to sink you deeper and deeper into your self-righteous pride. And so the testimony is this. Let go of the anchor and cling to Christ. The anchor of human merit is sinking you. Let go of your pride and cry out to Christ. He is your only Savior. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There is salvation in Christ because he and he alone is that life preserver and life giver. He is the one who has the righteousness that will satisfy The holiness of God. He and he alone can pay the penalty for the sin and the pride that weigh you down. He says, for I am gentle and humble at heart and I will and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Psalm 43 says this, in your sight no man is righteous. That's very clear. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20 says this. There is not a righteous man on the earth who continues to and does good and who never sins. Romans 3.20 says by the works of the law no flesh shall be declared righteous in his sight. 2 Timothy 1.9 says God has saved us and called us with a holy calling. According, not according to our works but according to his purpose and grace which he has granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Titus 3.5, he, he has saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in our own righteousness, but according to his mercies. This is the great declaration of the justification by faith in Christ. It is the great distinctiveness of the gospel. If we don't get justification right, we don't get the gospel right. If we don't get the gospel right, then it is not distinct from every other kind of human effort and human merit. There's only two religions in the world. You've been well taught that, right? There is human achievement. That doesn't save. That's an anchor sinking you down in your own sin. And there is divine achievement. And that divine achievement is only in Christ, in Christ alone. So we've seen here the distinctiveness of the nature of all of those who've been called in Christ. The distinct position, the distinct identity, and the distinct testimony. And we get to the fourth point here this morning. The distinct, distinct value of prizing Christ. Look at this text. It says, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, that I might gain Christ, that I might be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, which is through faith in Christ, a righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I might obtain from the resurrection from the dead. This is the distinct value, the distinct value of knowing Christ. That makes our fellowship distinct. It is all about the surpassing value of Christ. It is all about God's glory in Christ. You see, these things that were lost, these things, again, could not have gained salvation, could not have gained uh, favor, And so Paul here is more than glad to count those things as completely lost in the lost category and calculate them that way. Because verse 8, he's counted all things 
loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ. He says, in effect, I want to know Christ. That This is to come to grips and come to the conviction about justification by faith alone in Christ alone, to come in relationship with Christ, to know Christ here is an experiential knowledge. It's not just head knowledge. It's not just the gospel knowledge of the gospel. In order for us to receive and be in the gospel, we, we need to have an, a personal experience with Jesus Christ wherein by we acknowledge our guilt and our sin and we come and we acknowledge the righteousness of Christ and we come to personal faith in Christ. That's what he's saying here. Everything else is really rubbish. It's really rubbish. It's, it's thrown out. And really, it's another play on the word because this is the stuff that you would throw out to these dogs. So he looks at his whole Judaizing career, as Paul says, and he says, I've thrown it out in the streets and those Judaizing dogs can have it. Me, I just want to, I want to know Christ. I want to, be, to gain, that I might gain Christ and be found in him. He wants to be in that number. That number who are in the Lord. And he's embraced that. Secondly, it says that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. He is acknowledging not only does he want to know Christ, but he wants to be like Christ. He, he wants to, to live the life of Christ. The resurrected life. Speaking of his sanctification, we go to passages like Romans 6 and so forth. And then he says the fellowship of his sufferings. That's the koinonia, by the way, that appears there. If you want to be like Christ, then you're going to take on the sufferings of Christ. He wants to be conformed to his death. All the way, I want to know him, I want to be like him. And the last thing he notes is he wants to be with him. Look at verse 11. In order that I might obtain to the resurrection of the dead. What he's talking about there. The idea of attain means final destiny. He, he wants to know Christ. Because there's a surpassing uh, value to knowing Christ. And being saved and being in the Lord, he wants to be like Christ. That's where life's defining, surpassing value exists, being like Christ. And he wants to be with Christ in heaven. He wants to do away with all of that flesh, what remains, and experience the resurrection from the dead. He wants to see Jesus again. He wants to bodily be with Jesus in heaven. This is what compels. And this is what makes our, our fellowship distinct. This is what makes the church distinct. The gospel is distinct and therefore the church is separate. It's different. Our fellowship is distinct from the world. We are ones who do not glory in ourselves, who do not gloat in our pride, but those who are in the Lord, we're brothers and sisters, we're partners, we're partakers of the gospel, and we find our joy in the Lord. We have a separate, we have a distinct position. We have a distinct identity. We don't no longer judge each other according to the flesh and to all that would be separating us. But we have a common, distinct identity. We have a common and distinct testimony. We have a common and distinct value. We all want to know Christ, be like Christ, and we want to see and be with Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, that 
that you would help each and every one of us live distinctive lives, live according to the gospel, live in light of the gospel. Lord, that we would not only be not ashamed of the gospel, but we would live as citizens of the gospel. So Lord, help us, we pray, not only individually, but corporately. May we live our distinction as you've called us out of this world to be different and distinct, marked by the gospel. We ask this in Christ's name.